exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. May Christ be magnified in every step of our life, and I want to invite us um, to let's sing this song together, Christ be magnified.
Let's enter our intercessory prayer. Dear God, once again, God, we want to lift up our prayer um, to you, God. We want to lift up our thanksgiving, God. That um, Thank you, God, that you have given us a community in this place. Give us this place that we can um, worship you together, God, with our fellow brothers and sisters. We thank you for the family that you have given to us, for the work, for the school, for the ministry, everything, God, that you have blessed us with, God. God, we want to lift up um, some prayer topics, God. Um, we want to pray, God, first um, for the programs in this church. We want to pray for um, the church anniversary in September, for the tour to Israel in October, for um, the Thanksgiving dinner in November, and for the Christmas event in December. God, we want to pray, God, so that um, through all of these programs, God, it's not just something that we do every year, but may through these programs, um, your name can be magnified, God. Your name can be lifted up. And may this program can also be a channel where, where we can reach out to more people, more lives, so that more people can hear more about you as well, God. And we also want to pray, God, for our congregation in this place, um, those who are sick and recovering, um, for Herman Yudi's mother, for Ong Bek Bi, um, um, for Mas, uh, Mas Mur Wong's aunt. Um, we want to pray for those who are sick uh, and weak in their body, God. May you uh, heal them. May you be the one who give them strength and also care for them. And also for the family member who are um, taking care of them, God. May you also um, give them strength, God. Uh, so that, um, they all can go through this together with you, God. I uh, also want to pray for those who are and will go on vacation. May on this time they can um, have a good break. And in this break also, may they also still remember um, their spiritual discipline with you, God. Um, so um, remember to have their relationship with you, God. also want to pray for the students, for the prof professionals, and for the elderly as well, um, for the children. Um, for yeah, everyone, God, in this congregation, God, may you be the one who um, see us in every step of our life, and may you be the one who guide us as well, God. Um, I want to invite us to pray together for the mission. We want to pray together for um, people who heard the gospel through the mission team to Indonesia. Uh, we also want to pray for the ministry and safety of our missionaries, um, like Fina Linan, Dana, and Karen Otsby. Um, Reverend William and Reverend Jim Yost. Uh, let's pray together for this. Let's also pray together for the countries and the government, for Indonesia, um, California, USA, um, and maybe for other countries that you have heart for as well. And let's pray also for the um, political stability, for the world economy, and also for the COVID situation around the world as well. Let's pray for this together. And lastly, I want to give us some time to pray for our personal requests and thanksgiving to God. Let's pray.
Thank you, God, for the time that you have given to us, God, in this place to lift up our intercessory prayer. May you be the one, God, who listen to our prayers and answer it according to your time, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading for today is taken from Luke 6, verse 27 to 30. Let's read these verses together. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Um, now let's um, prepare our hearts for the sermon. Uh, may the Holy Spirit guide us to learn from the Word of God, um, to love Him with all of our hearts, and to love others as how we love ourselves too. So let's sing this song together and prepare our hearts. No one. 
want to invite Pastor Michael Chow to share the word of God. Good morning. I'm so excited Stephen and Joy's here. You know, we see God the Father and we see his son. And so I'm like looking around for your son. I'm like, well, oh, that's right. He's in class. So, um, applying mercy. We become Christians, and then once we do, we're like, yay, we're going to get to be with God soon. But while we're here on earth, things happen. Things happen, and it enrages us. And then a lot of times, it's really hard for us to let go, and it's really hard for us to, like, move on. And so I want to talk about, like, one of the epitomes, the heights of feelings, aside from love, hate. I mean, you know, crimes against Asians are still going on, and it's like, come on, man, like, I was, you know, some of us were born here, some of us came over here, and we're very productive, we're adding value to society, it's very confusing. I drove a brand new Dodge Durango SRT here today, it's not my car, it's a car rental, very powerful car. The seats have AC vents. Crazy. The, uh, when I dropped my car off at the body shop, I was, well, before I do, do that, Enterprise picked me up, and I was like, whoa, I get this car? And he goes, well, the insurance of the person who hit you covers it. You want it? I'm like, sure. I'm in Sacramento. It was 105 degrees. He goes, are you hot? Yes, let me take care of it. And he did this thing, and I was like, woo, right? I was like, woo. So I'm driving that car, V8, very powerful. Filled up the gas tank last night, drove over here, quarter tank gone. And I'm like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of anger, in terms of things happening to us, even as Christians, I'm like, God, how do I talk to Geico? <laughs> right, because I got hit in the back, and it made me hit the car in the front. And so I drove the car to an auto shop. They took pictures, sent it in. And the guy from Geico adjuster calls me. And I'm like, hey. He goes, hey, from the pictures that I can see for the back, back and the front, we're going to send you about $1,500. I was like, what? I mean, I was thinking the car was totally, OK, let's see. You're evil. And I think you're wicked and hateful. <laughs> I was so mad. And, and you know, my, 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 my wife is like, that's not godly. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. But I, I was like, Lord, how do I, you know, I was able to get more of it. But, you know, and then I was like, hey, we had two car seats in the car. The car seats were totally fine. And according to the California law, you need to replace them. Oh, okay. Well, how much were they? Here's the receipt. Okay, 800 bucks. I mean, car seats are expensive. Here you go. Like, I'm like, why do I need to prove why do I need to pull the facial hair off of your face to 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 get me what I deserve, right? And, and like we all pay insurance and it's and so I'm just like, I hate this world, God, take me away. I know, Michael, that's why I came, you know, and it's like, okay, that's right. See, it's hard to see it's it's easy to forget, and then after a while we're like, oh, why why are we doing here? Why are we doing all of all of this? And here, from the verse that you guys just read, right, if someone hits you, like, oh, oh, the other side, too, like, they come take my jacket. I'm a small guy. It takes me a while to find a jacket that fits me. They take my jacket, and I go, here, take my dress shirt, too. It's like, okay, Jesus, you want us to live like a doorman, huh? People are just going to walk all over us? Great. I, I totally want to be a Christian now. Okay, but once we understand why Luke records these things, then we get to see and realize how much value and how much worth God sees in us and how much we will actually be receiving. And in fact, we already have it all, just not yet. It's, it's confusing, but it's like, oh, okay. So today, um, I want to look at 
um, some of these tough sit situations because situations do come up here in the church and then sometimes we're like, well, how, how do we deal with it? Because their behavior is, is not ethical. So what we ought to do is this. But then if we do that, then are we like not being kind? Like, are we not being graceful or merciful? But I, I think we need to take these steps and like remove them or, or you, you know, and sometimes it's hard because we're supposed to love, right? So I want to clear up some of these things, you know, um, some of the things that I grew, grew up with was, you know, when some does something kind of bad, we're like, hey, you, you know, and then they're, they're like, don't, don't judge me because the Bible says, you know, you don't judge me because only God can judge it. And I'm like, wait, what? Oh, shoot. You know, then you, you're just kind of stuck. So I really want to get down to the heart of it. All right. So um, I got turned on. Down. I mean, like, this guy works. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not making fun of you. Or, or you guys can just click. Or maybe I didn't do my PowerPoint slide right. But yeah. So, in the ancient world, there was this this idea that you are to believe, and you are to imitate the the leader. You are to imitate the person who is in charge. And so Jesus draws upon this. And so what what God is saying is, hey. I forgave you guys of a, you know, a lot of things. I let go of a lot of, I'm trying to get there. So, so I want to define mercy. Mercy is releasing people and circumstances from blame that they deserve. So when you do certain things, uh, that's like bad, and, well, there should be consequences. But what God is saying is, no, you, you, you don't have to deal with the consequence. It's like, oh, really? Yeah, I'm going to for, for, forgive you because... You know, you have this evil tendency in you that needs to be fixed. But if you take upon me, I'm going to change you. And so basically what God is saying is you need to act like this, and you need to treat others in such a way as well. You know, maybe, maybe it's how my PowerPoint set up, because sometimes at, at home in the church, I would have a difficult time pushing. So mercy is one of God's primary qualities. And when Luke talks about, thank you, when, when Luke talks about, um, you know, mercy is releasing people, right? So just, we let it go from the blame that they deserve. And that's hard. And that's really hard for me to talk to Geico and be like, hey, like the lady who hit me, my, my boys are in the car, three and seven. I got out of the car and I was like, oh man. And then the lady in the front was like, you hit me. And I'm like, well, she hit me, and then I hit you. Oh. So I went back, and she was like, I didn't see your red light come on. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. She's like, yeah, I don't know that you stopped. I don't know that your car alerted me that you were slowing down. And so I'm like, oh, what do I do? Oh, yeah, I have a dash cam that records front and back. Whoop, done. <laughs> and, and I'm like, why can't you guys just be forthright? You know, just, just be honest, right? Why do I need to to cover myself, and now I'm looking for a dash cam that records left and right, too. You know, it's, it's like, it, it, you know, it, it's really difficult to, to kind of live like, like this. All right, so let me move on to the next verse. Or you guys can just go. And so um, sometimes we look at the Bible and we go, hey, why doesn't it give every single scenario that when it happens, what we're supposed to do so that we would know what we're supposed to do? Well, the Bible doesn't do that. So what we're going to go through here, it doesn't offer a full list of ethical things for us to do. Like, when this happens, do this. When this happens, do that. It doesn't do that, unfortunately. But from what Luke talks about, we can then reason our way into how to implement it. We can understand what, what he's trying to say and how he's applying, and we can then apply to other things. So that's what we're going to try to do. So, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt. So when Jesus was talking about this, Luke understood this. And Jesus was talking about it in an eschatological sense. Like, think about when Jesus comes back. Okay? Now, with that in mind, how are we to treat others now, knowing that Jesus will be back and knowing that we will have everything 
because if, if we have Jesus, we will have everything. How should we treat people now? And so Luke's trying to get us to think about when we behave and act now, that we do so with the very end in mind. And that's very difficult because we, we live now, if someone hits me, I'm going to hit them back. I, like, like, I, that's the automatic response, you know? Uh, some of you guys are probably a lot better than me. Um, and uh, so here, Luke probably experienced a lot of hatred before he found Jesus. He probably knew what it meant to be mistreated. And that's probably why he's covering it a little bit more. So here, Luke perceives the Jewish leaders of the time and the Roman leaders, because the Romans were in charge, and Luke perceived the politicians as hateful and wicked, meaning that they do whatever they're going to do. Like, Luke does not like them at all. And maybe because Luke's, it's happened to him. And so um, here in America, you know, I'm currently not working. I'm waiting for my son to turn five so then he can go to school. So in the meantime, I'm like, well, I'm not bringing in any income. I'm not, like, helping pay off our Camry. What am I going to do? So I have a business background, so I studied the markets when COVID crashed it. And so when Biden was in off, uh, well, Biden and Trump was going at each other, you know, uh, I think in late 2020, uh, and I've been following it, and I could tell Trump was going to lose. And Biden said, if I get into office, I'm going to kill fossil fuel. I'm going to kill the oil and gas industry. And I'm thinking, well, that's not good because COVID shut everything down. Everything was shut down. No oil was being pumped, and the world was shut down. When the vaccines come out and when the world opens up, we're going to need all this stuff, and there's not going to be much of it. So the price of oil is going to go up. I was like, no, that's a bad idea. That's a... Hey, honey, can I buy some oil stocks? Not with our joint savings. You do with whatever you want with yours. And so I had like, uh, uh, you know, I came from the banking background, sort of, when I worked. So I, I had like a lot of suits. So I sold like most of them. So I put all the money into like oil stocks, right? You guys see how expensive gas is now. I sold it and paid off our Cam 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 Camry and our Highland Highlander. She was so happy with me. You want to know why this is so important? Most of the time, she's not happy with me. <laughs> so, see, the point that I'm trying to say here is not, well, go make a lot of money in the stock market. Okay, right now it's a bear market. Things are coming down. Okay. But the point that I'm saying is politicians and world leaders will do what they're going to do, whether they're going to help the citizens or not. And I saw this coming. I, I called my bros and my sis, and I said, hey, man, <laughs> uh, we're in for a higher energy costs. Food's going to cost more because if energy costs more, it's, it's going to take more to make food and cars and furnitures, right? And I'm like, and, and then when it happened, I'm like, oh my gosh, it, it happened. And that's why Luke perceived the Jewish leaders and Romans as hateful because they're just going to do what they're going to do. I'm, I'm not saying Biden is evil. He there's a group behind him that makes all the decisions. He just kind of, you know, talks. I don't, I'm not trying to get too political here, but um, uh, instead of, and what Luke is saying here is, I used to respond to them with just anger and stuff, but now I see life differently because I know what is to come and I know who I have in Jesus. And so he's trying to, to, to share this with others, how we are, ought, ought to live. And so, Instead of responding to them with blame, the kingdom of God calls for attitudes and actions that seek the good of others, and therefore that builds up the community. In other words, if someone has you and they're beating you up and they're being really, really bad to you, what Luke is saying here is you look past their actions and behavior to realize that they were once hurt and they were probably once abused and their younger self, they probably just wanted to seek out what is good, what is pure, what is right. And they're just taking this out on you. Even while they're doing all this to you, what Luke is trying to say here is you look past that to who they were, and you take hold of that, and you pull it out and go, calm down. 
this is actually you, and you are lovable, you have the ability to change, you can get through all of this if you know the one true God. And that's what Luke is saying, is when they're bashing you and when they're coming on you with their wickedness, you look past that and you do the unthinkable. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is so noble. And this is exactly what God did. And in the midst, during that time, Luke was trying to do that, even though he himself experienced one of the worst. And I'm like, wow, the heart of Luke. So Luke's form of nonviolence goes beyond non-retaliation. In other words, his nonviolence is, is not just don't retaliate. It's, it's change their life. What? This bad person who inflicted harm, you want me to, so you want me to call back that adjuster person and wish him well and find out how I can help him or, you know, pray for, uh, does that make sense? He was trying to cheat me, you know? And even then, Luke's like, because if you think about things in an eschatological form, you have everything already. What's going on now? You're just going through the pains of other people. And they need Jesus just as much. And it's like, wow, how do you look through all that? All right. 30. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it. It's just so hard. Do to others as you would have them do to you. So verse 30, Luke talks about an economic situation, so basically financial, mo monetary, in which that, what Luke was trying to say is that uh, during, during the time, there were actually a lot of people who were doing well in life, but they were exploited and they were taken advantage of. So when you see people on the streets, they used to not be on the streets. Something happened that got them there. And so if you're in a position to, to give... What Luke is, is, is saying here is that even though you think you're living paycheck to paycheck, keeping in mind what you have in Christ, you're rich. So if you can, maybe you ought to. There's no guilt trip here. And I'm, and I'm sitting here and I'm like, man, that's so rough. Because I'm you know, trying to potty train my son and, so that he can go to school. And, and you know, I, we're, I'm spending like... I put my son through two weeks of my seven-year-old through two weeks of golfing, two weeks of swimming over the summer, and like all of that was like, like, fifteen hundred bucks or something. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, and I'm supposed to give, and and then Luke is like, you're rich, dude. It's like, well, how do I, okay? But this goes deeper. This goes deeper, and he's trying to set into pers pers perspective for us not to focus too much on, on that. And with the whole go golden rule, right, do to others as you would have them do to you, this is a culture-shifting one. Picture in your workplace. Um, there are a lot of people who, you know, are there, and they might not want to do work, or they make excuses to push work away. And because you do work, and you do a good job, your boss keeps going to you. And so in the end, you do 80% of the work, and right? It, 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 yeah, you know exactly what I'm, what I'm saying. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to change things. And then a lot of it that my, my wife is finding out is that, you know, like 80% of the men who work in her engineering de department, they like have high blood pressure. So during break time, they're like, Hey, so uh, what pill are you taking? What 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 brand are you on? Adderall? Oh man, yeah, I I just I just I just got over that one. They're just casually talking about it as if it's not a big deal. Everyone's so highly stressed out, and so my wife shows up, and even though she's been there for a few years, she's still considered like one of the new newest because she does her job. People think she's um, like overachieving. She's like, well, I'm just doing what my job description says. And you think I'm overachieving, right? And then everyone's like, oh, man, you need to calm down. Working for the state, you, you take your time. We're never in a rush. Our paycheck's guaranteed. You see them taxpayers? That's, that's guaranteed. We're not working for no private firm where we got to go out and get our own, like, you know, money and clients and stuff. You know, money is coming. Our jobs, pension, yeah, secure. Like, <laughs> oh, I don't want to get into it, but there's a lot of people where 
to be uh, vested or to get to a point where you can't get fired, you need to get to one year working for, for, for the state. So the first 364 days, my wife is like, people work hard. And then once the 65th day happens, she's like, she sees their production just fall. And I'm, it, it, it enrages me because, you know, <laughs> we're our tax buddy. So um, anyway, so she's trying to change the culture. She's trying to change the attitude of the place by how she res res responds. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I, when I was in Seattle, I had young people who would say, oh yeah, Michael, I'm looking for another church. Yeah, I'm looking for another church that acts like this, that they treat other people like that, and they have all of these um, um, amenities, and they have all of that. It's like, what? So you just want to be a part of a church that has worked hard to get to a certain place, and you just want to get in there and, and benefit. Did you know that by you doing that, you, you make yourself into a spiritual consumer and you don't grow at all? And they're like, what, what does that mean? So in the workplace, doing verse 31 is essentially the same as changing the cult culture. So if you start to respond differently, and then if you start to spend your break times with certain coworkers who's just bitter, but they're willing to hang out with you, and then you talk things out with them, and then, then they see how you deal with things, which is godly ways, and even though you're not using the word Jesus, they start to, it starts to affect them. And then the other group that they hang out with, they start to notice that this person's a little bit different, and how they deal with things is a little bit, it takes some time, but next thing you know, the, the office starts to shift starts to feel differently. If you want an office or a church to be a certain way, you start living that way. You start praying that way. You start doing that, and it becomes infectious, and it just permeates. Next thing you know, the office is something different. That's what it means to change culture. That's what it means to change culture. If we take, like, a white sheet of paper, and if we do, like, one pencil mark, like a dot, you, you, you can't even see it. But over time, if you start to dot more, next thing you know, you're like, man, that white sheet of paper, it's like gray now. You keep going at it. It's like, oh, man, it's like charcoal. It's, like, it's almost black now. You see, it, 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 when everyone starts acting and doing like the kingdom, it's like kingdom, like heaven here on earth. And this is kind of where Luke's kind of getting out. We're, we're going to get into more, more of it. But. So verse 32. Uh, yeah, so to wrap up that other one. Did I just go back? <laughs> if you want to live in a world that has the qualities of, of the kingdom, just start treating people like it. You know, Because once everyone starts to, you show up, it, it'll be just like that. Um, verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Sinners do that too. And if you lend to those from whom you expect payment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, meaning those who like, don't know, know God. And they expect to be repaid in full. Jesus calls this the old age. Uh, during that time of Jesus, if we look at the entire era of like hundreds of years put to together, uh, uh, this is the so-and-so di dynasty, right? This is the so-and-so. During that time, it's, it's known as the um, Hel Hellenistic er era. And during that entire era, it's all about reciprocity. What I do to you, you do back to, to me, okay? What I do to you, you do back to me. And if you do this to me, I'll do it back to you. Jesus calls this the old age. And what Jesus is saying is, if you love those who love you, dude, you, what, what's new? You're just continuing the old ways. Don't do that. Do more. And that's why Luke is like, yeah, if they take your coat, give them your shirt. And it, you know, it's like, oh, that's what you guys are trying, trying, trying to say. Okay. So if Jesus' followers relate to others based on nothing more than reciprocity, then you're simply reinforcing the quality of life of earth. You're just continuing that culture. And Jesus is like, stop it. 
Instead, in Luke 35, Jesus urges disciples, us, to replace the old age qualities of behavior with those that are characteristic of the kingdom. In so doing, we imitate God. In so doing, you, you, you get culture change, right? Just like in the workplace, doing the opposite is difficult. When there's an explosion of a built building and everything's falling apart, what do you do? You run away. Of course you do. You don't want to get hurt. But what Jesus is saying is, hey, there might be hurt people. Run to the building. It's like the opposite. But you don't just do the opposite just because. There's underlying reasons, and those reasons are godly and spiritual and powerful. And if we don't know God, if we don't know scripture, we won't know why. Why are you living like a door, doormat? It's because I'm filthy rich. It's like, what? It, it, well, it's, um, come over to my house. We've got a Bible study going on. I'd like to explain it to you. Are you curious why I choose to live like a doormat? Oh, heck yeah, you're dumb. I want to know why you're dumb. <laughs> and they come over and it's like, oh, man, this is what truth is. You know, it's just, just hey, go with the flow. They're, they have their own understanding of things. Uh, one of this, this one pastor who I love, and uh, he just got buried, um, to a Mian girl. Anyway, he was like, I was like, how did you come to know Christ? He says, there was this youth pastor who talked about God and he annoyed me. So I would go to his house every Friday night and I would like pick apart the Bible and I would just like, you know, get mad. And he would always patiently um, explain to me things. And after an hour, I'm still like, you know, you're wrong. This is, you know, and then as I'm leaving the door, as I'm leaving his house, he'll say, I'll see you next Friday, Chris. He'll be like, yeah, I'll be back. I'll be back. You know, and just that, he ended up becoming like a pastor, and, and, and he's like helping so many other people just, just because someone was patient with him. You see, if I could be patient with just that one person and change their life over a one, two-year period and to know that in their lifetime they're going to go change like 2,000 people's lives, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like I had a part in changing the 2,000 people because I got, because I got this person, right? Kind of like the Apostle Paul, you know, he was a Christian ki killer, but once God turned his life around, he, <laughs> he's the most important figure in the New, New, New Testament. All right, so, um, so that's imitate God, be kind. Okay, next one. Be merciful as your father is merciful so from the very beginning as i said the culture is to imitate the the lead leader so when jesus said this he's basically echoing the culture but 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 he's using uh his fa father's teaching in the culture that's why he's such a master te teacher all right we're just about done okay this one i, I want to get into do not judge and you will not be judged do not condemn and you will not be condemned forgive and you will be forgiven. This one's difficult because by the sound of this, we're not supposed to judge. When someone does something that's not good, we're not supposed to tell them that it's kind of not good. Okay? But when Luke said this, he said it with the eschatological in mind, meaning when you judge them, do not judge as if you know how the rest of their life is going to be. Do not judge them as if you, you, you know how the rest of their life is going to be. In other words, you can judge, but don't judge them as if you, you are categorizing them and saying this is how they are. If someone is not, if someone is in, let's say, a leadership position here at church, and their ethical behavior outside of church, things that they're doing or things that they're going to kind of getting involved in it's just kind of not right sometimes we just kind of like let's just pray for them and 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 hope for the best while still allowing them to be in a position where they can affect and influence others but they're really nice and loving yes they are but it's this part of their life that's just kind of not so what we do is we say hey your life is not lining up we can't have you be in this position or that's a little bit too extreme. 
Or let's just say one of our church members is just disruptive whenever they show, show up, right? It's just always messing things up, you know? And what do we do? We go to them and say, hey, your behavior on Sundays is making it difficult for the spirit to work. So therefore, we need you to stop coming for a bit. What, you say I'm bad? I'm not saying you're evil. I'm not saying you're not evil, wicked or just whatever. I'm saying that right now, the phase and the season in life that you're at, it, it's, it's very disruptive to the body of Christ. So we'll go to your church. I mean, we'll go to your house on Sundays or once a week. You pick a day that's most convenient and we will do church there together. Us and maybe a few le le leaders will pray, we'll sing songs, you know, we'll, we'll read, read scripture. But in terms of you being with the bigger body of Christ, it, it's no, because it's, you're very, dis you, you, you got stuff going on that needs more one-on-one -on -one, and you're disrupting and you're preventing the spirit from doing its work. So for now, we can't have you coming. Can you do that? Yes. Because you're not saying that they're not welcomed back forever, and you're not saying that they are like this forever and that they will never change. You see, we can judge, but, but when we do so, check your heart. Are you just being evil? Is this like, oh, this is our chance to get rid of this person. Okay, then now that's bad, right? This part gets tricky. So Christians sometimes make the warning to stop judging and condemning to mean that the church should never make a moral judgment wrong. Rather, in the eschatological context, when we look at everything with the big picture, what Luke means is that the church should not act like it knows the final verdict on those who oppose the kingdom of God. Human perception is always finite. Is it okay to be angry? Yeah, because angry lets you know that something's not right. But the Bible also says this, in your anger, do not sin. Oh, okay. I'm angry, but I'm going to make sure that my actions are not ill-intentioned. And if it's not, then it's okay. In your anger, do not sin, which assumes and which means that it's okay to be angry so long as you watch yourself and don't sin. It's okay, and it's totally fine to, to do. Oh, there was a point I wanted to make. Yeah, so, so it is okay for us to judge in the meantime, but when we judge, it's off of how they're acting, and it's off of what's going on right now. But it doesn't mean that they're done. We can't do that, okay? This one's a little bit difficult, but okay. So this is what Luke means. Man, there was a point I wanted to make. All right, so... The church should not act like it knows the final verdict. So yes, it is okay, and it is fine. Hope this part's not too confusing here. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured against you. So this is basically saying, hey, so long as you're right with God, you can make decisions and you can act on his behalf as if God is here. So it's okay to do so. So to, uh, to wrap up here, the witnessing community, the church, you guys extend the mercy of God to those who otherwise would face destructive lives. Meaning there are others out there who need God, but they're so far away from God that, that they can be violent or that they can be very evil, ill-intentioned. But even then, if you can, do not um, like leave them. Because at one point, we were very far to the left and to the right and in need of God and our lives were falling apart, but someone reached out to us and they spent time with us. And now your life is different. This is the same. They need God just as much. So. We need to extend the mercy of God to those who otherwise would face destructive lives. We are to be his hands and feet. And that's why even in the face of they're bashing you and they're hurting you, you know, 
like imagine you're on the ground and they're sitting on your chest and they're just going at you. Even in your pain, you're still trying to reach into their soul to pull them out. Oh, Mo Moana. Yeah, Mo Moana? Uh, give me some sound, sound music. No? Okay, all right. All right. So this, this is that one uh, cartoon I'm going to show? Okay, well, towards, towards the very end, um, um, that, that very evil volcanic god, goddess, was going at Moana and was like, ah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to eat you up. I'm, I'm so angry. Someone, you know, ruined my life. And then the only way to help change your life is, their life is to get close to them. And when Mo Moana got close to this, like, well, actually, that volcanic god evil thing was coming to her, and she somehow, like, maneuvered past some stuff and, and, and got to Rafiki? I forgot what her name is. And put the, the heart of the stone just right there and just changed her. In the midst, you still... And that's what makes a powerful testament. That's, that's how God wants us to function. It's really difficult when someone's bashing you and, and you're still like, I'm still here for you, though. You know? <laughs> but that's really what God did for us. Two, those who extend mercy find that their experience of mercy deepens as part of their present experience of church. So, for example, you can leave to go to another church that's like, I don't know, the way you want it. Or you can stay here. And however the church is that needs to be changed or God's calling you to change, you stay and be a part of that change. And as that change happens, that change happened in you also. You grew. Whereas if you just kind of go to another church that's kind of like solid already, you're, you're, you're just kind of like, you know, it, it, nothing happened to you. There's no life change. You know, you're just benefiting off of however it is. There's no life transformation in you. That's not good, okay? So those of us who extend mercy find that the experience in the process of it also allows your spirituality to deepen at the same time. Okay, final point, final point. And so by us together doing this, the church, this community, models the promise of the kingdom to other communities. You guys just do what you do. Just do what you do. The communities around can just be falling apart and... Uh, you know, this is going on, and, and they might be acting in certain ways, but to see this community consistent over time, they're going to be like, man, there's something about that group over there. Like, we're going up and down and left and right, and nothing is stable, but that community is just chugging along. What is it? It's going to bug them. It's going to bug them because you guys are, like, hanging in there through thick and thin. They're going to get curious. They're going to want to find out why you're different. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. This is one of the old classic songs. They will know that you guys, man, these guys probably, they probably have it. Like, they probably have it. I want to know what it is. Okay, so one, two, and three. Um, hatred and things like that. But uh, lastly, when it comes to that whole judging thing, you guys will have difficult situations. But remember, so long as it is done with a righteous heart, you can be angry. You can be upset with how they are and how they're dis dis disrupting things. Oh, yes, that was the example I, will, uh, I, I, I wanted to give real quick about that ju judging one. Uh, Jesus and Peter, when Jesus was with the disciples and then Jesus was like, hey, this is what's going to happen to me. They're going to capture me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go over. Ah, shoot. Um, they're going to capture me, and they're going to hurt me, and they're going to torment me, and, and, and all of this. And then Peter was like, no, that's not going to happen to you, right? No, Jesus. And then what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. That, that was hurt, hurtful. See, look, Jesus was like, this is God's will, and this is what's going to happen. And however bad it sounds, if you oppose it, it's like you are one with the devil. So that's why here in the church, if God is doing something, and if God's spirit is working, but if there's going to be a couple individuals that's going to disrupt things, and if they're not lining up, that's like as if they are of the devil. And that's why it's okay to cast them out. 
temporarily, but we deal with them on the side. We don't cast them out permanently. Once again, we'll still do home visits. We'll still meet up with them for lunch. We will be praying for them. They're a brother and sister. We're not going to forsake them. But while we're meeting together and the Lord is speaking and, and he's communicating and, and he's changing hearts and, and if there's people who are disrupting that, their spirit is not in the right place. So yes, it's okay to judge them temporarily, remember. And it's not an opportunity, oh, finally, I've always, I've always wanted to get rid of this person. No, no, shame on you, no, right? So the, it's okay, but, but of, of course, when it comes to judging and d deciding and doing these, these things, we don't have the final verdict. It's just so far as now. So, so th this is a tough one, a very tough one within our chur churches, so I just wanted to hit, hit on, on this. But if you guys do decide to make any drastic de decisions, it's, it's one that you guys will have to come together and pray, pray about it. How's our heart? Okay. All right. So I didn't, I didn't want this whole mercy thing to trap us Christians as if we just lay around and whatever happens. No. God has given us the authority and the power to act on his behalf. So you can make decisions for the good of the church, but we don't do it in ill-fated, evil, wicked ways. Okay, all right. Uh, I went over a bit, but thank you. Thank you so much. As already announced, we are going to have a communion, but before that, let's pray one more for, to prepare our heart. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the message. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy to us. May your word help us to extend the same thing that we already received from you, the other people will experience the same love, grace, and mercy too. As we are going to take part in this communion, Lord, we ask that you will forgive all the wrongdoing, the action that not according to your word, your will, that we already did in the past days. Forgive us that we may not sin against your body and your blood. So as we receive the bread and also the cup, may we are uh, remembering your great love, sacrifice, and that on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. So thank you for your great love that you sacrifice yourselves, that we may experience the eternal life in you. Thank you, Lord. Only in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's the uh, song, uh, sing this song, I Gave My Life. And after that, I will invite our deacon to prepare the table.
as usual, you will be given the package. Just stretch out your hand to receive it. After you have it, pray personally. And after everybody has it, we will eat and drink it together. Please. Brothers and sisters, on the night when our Lord, our Lord was betrayed, he took a breath. After giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given to you, take and eat it in remembrance of me. After that, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink it in remembrance of me. So let's eat and drink it together with a thankful heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity opportunity to take part in this communion to remember your great love die for our sin we thank you that you bear the consequences of the wrongdoing of our sin we thank you by doing this we may experience your eternal love, eternal grace, and eternal life as we confess you are our Lord and Savior. So Lord, help us in our life to be your witness to other people that you are the Savior of this world. Thank you, only in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So after the service, please throw the communion package in the rubbish bin at your back. Let's continue by preparing our offering to the Lord. Let's prepare our offering as an expression of joy and gratitude for God's goodness. If you would like to give an offering, you may send it via Zelle, drop it in the offering bag or in the offering box after the service. Stay. 
Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you, God, for all of the blessings that you have given to us, God. And right now, God, we have um, given back a little bit of um, a lot of things, God, that you have given to us, God. May you use this offering, God, um, so that it can be used for the glory of your kingdom, God. Um, we also want to pray, God. We are thankful that we have heard the message that we have heard from Pastor Michael Chow. Um, may we learn from this, God, so that um, may we can be your people who extend the mercy to those who otherwise would face destructive lives. May we also find our experience of mercy to be deepened while extending it. And may we also be an example of God's kingdom for other communities, God. And I want to pray also, God, may um, we realize when we act, we check into our hearts and we don't have um, ill intention, God, for those who um, hurt us, God. Um, we also want to pray for Pastor Michael's uh, ministry. May you always bless him so that in every word that he preach, um, it can touch people's heart. You may you use him also to reach more people um, and yeah to share um, your word and the truth God um, thank you God um, uh, we want to lift up this prayer into your hands in the name of Jesus Christ we pray Amen, Amen. you may be seated let's read our memory first from Luke 6 um, 31 let's read this together and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Announcement. Um, welcome and thank you for attending today's service. Um, if you are new, um, welcome to um, our English service today. And um, feel free to fill the connection card that you can find in, um, under the seat in front of you. And you can put it inside the offering box, which is um, the black box near the exit. Um, just a reminder that our service starts at 10, so I invite us, all of us to come on time with a prepared heart um, to the house of the Lord. Next, um, next week English service is by um, Reverend Timothy Sting. Um, the topic is by grace, not by hereditary. And um, we have our young adult fellowship in this place every Friday, 7:45, and it's going to be an outreach night. So um, we encourage um, all of the young adult to come and also bring a friend so that um, yeah, more people can um, hear about God. And congratulations to the graduates from Sunday School. Um, and they have the ceremony today in the IS room. For offering, um, if you would like to give an offering, you can uh, send it via Zelle account or um, drop it in the offering box as well. And this is... Uh, link and um, QR code for the church activities photos. Uh, you can uh, scan this code to see the photo albums or visit the uh, um, website as well. Uh, church bulletin, if you would like to know more about um, the complete bulletin and all of the activities in this church, feel free to go to this link or scan this QR code. And uh, see you next week. So um, let's stand up and let's sing doxology. After that, I would like to um, ask Pastor Michael to lead us in benediction. God, you've given us everything, but it, until we meet you, 
you have work for us to do here on this earth to extend you in your life. Teach us how to live, how to treat each other, and teach us how to let go because you have done so with us. And help us to see the bigger picture. This will help us to hold on and be able to identify the joys and friendships and lovely things in life. In Jesus' name, amen. may be seated. You can take a quiet time and see you next week.